Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, um, wherever you are at the moment. Uh, uh, we both, Stephen and myself, uh, we want to welcome you for another webinar from Search Metrics about ranking factors in 2018, uh, especially uh, into you know a thing where we um, look into a niche and go even beyond the niche. Um, if you want to know who we are, um, I'm Marcus Tober. I'm CTO and founder of Search Metrics, and this is Stephen. Hi. Stephen is um, uh, our director of our content marketing team, and maybe you say a couple of words about yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Stephen uh, Bench Caton. I'm uh, I work on the white papers. This webinar is following up on a white paper about niche ranking factors. So um, I'll help Marcus. And we'll have a little chat and explain what we're talking about today. All right. So let me introduce a couple of things. So this is like how to watch the webinar, how to do a couple of things. Um, after the webinar, you're going to have a follow-up email with the recording, with link, you know, you don't need to take a lot of notes. So it's really important that you, you know, watch the webinar, that you maybe take notes when you have questions, because we have a lot of time in the end of the webinar to go over your questions. That's, that's super important. And we want to make it uh, definitely uh, all about you and your questions. And like we said, after the webinar also, you get not just the email with the recording, you also get in this email um, a link to a survey monkey because we really want to get your feedback and want to improve the whole webinar series on a continuous basis. Uh, what we also use is we use a lot of information in the webinar um, from the recent ranking factor studies that we did. So if you, um, you know, um, follow the link on searchmetrics.com for the ranking factors in our niches, you can download the white paper right after webinar and get a lot of insights even far beyond yep. um, the data we discuss at the moment. Great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll just run through what we want to talk about today. We want to start off looking at why this study isn't just like any other ranking factors study. Then we're actually going to dive into the niches, look at the data. Then we have a little uh, step beyond that goes even beyond the concept of niche ranking factors. And then we'll come to your questions. So let's start. Why isn't this just another ranking factors study? A lot of people, um, when they think about ranking factor studies over the last few years, they're um, not entirely convinced. They think it's a slightly dubious concept. And we've picked out a few quotes from the internet. Some people say it's a silly metric, like word count, for example, doesn't make sense. Some people refer to them as uh, fictions, saying they're just um, spurious information and not actually relevant. Some people go further and say that it's dumb or even dumber to just look at ranking factors and try to make uh, extrapolations about all of the internet. And then some people even say they should just be killed off, die a horrible death. So what does that mean for a company um, like Search Metrics that um, is focused on ranking factors and has uh, made it part of our mission? Um, does it mean we just agree with that and say it's silly? Or do uh, does that mean we give up? No. That means we need to get better. We go back to the drawing board. We have another look at the data. We look at different kinds of data because um, we firmly believe that there must be ranking factors. Google's built, um, it's a machine, so it's analyzing pages. It's not looking at every single page on, from a subjective point of view. Um, so we just need to get better. We don't give up, we improve ourselves. And that's actually a super important point, you know, because in that moment, and that's that happened to us and, you know, in, in many conferences to me a lot of times is, you know, when you talk to people about ranking factors, I mean, the, the tweets that we just put in here is, is also reflecting some of the conversations I have had. And I mean, the, the thing is this, in that moment when there's a machine that kind of like orders um, many results into a certain order and that the ones who appear um, at first or more often, they get more traffic, they're more successful. And if a machine does the ordering, there must be something you can reverse engineer to look into the um, the core of the, the algorithm. And this is actually what we are really curious about because in that moment, um, when Google makes these decisions, there must be some factors you can find that can't be just all you know personalized. There must be a lot of like like the foundation of evidence. And then on top, the icing on the cake is the personalization, but the evidence and the foundation is something we really want to look into. And that's why it's super cool what we did here. And uh, we hope you will kind of like yep. agree or disagree in the end. So now we get um, into the niche. The first question you may be asking is, what, what do we mean with niche? What are niches? Um, do you want to explain? Yes. It? So the, the thing is, you know, when we started with the ranking factor split, that was in December 2015, when we thought, okay, the typical ranking factors are dead. 
uh, we started with bigger industries. Over time, we have developed uh, insights into niche where, for example, in e-commerce, we split into two different niches that there's almost no overlap, like furniture and cars. Or if you continue in finance, because Google really takes care about, um, you know, uh, good rankings uh, with, you know, financial information and then all these things, we took a look into, you know, credit or student loans and loans, etc., and financial planning. So very different. Or if you continue in health, we looked into recipes or weight loss, different as well. And the last one is, you know, when you look into uh, travel, um, we looked into, you know, where you search for um, point of interest, so destinations or something super specific camping. And the reason we took these, these different niches, we really wanted to understand what's the, uh, the, the difference and the deviation of these two niches. Whereas when you just look at travel, you see just broad data. So and it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, we um, should from, uh, from the emphasize these aren't um, the only eight niches that are relevant or the most relevant eight, but um, we can't go through a thousand or a million uh, different niches here. So we've picked out eight that can hopefully give some sort of representation um, and applicability to what you're doing. Yes. And the same goes for the kinds of ranking factors we're looking at. We couldn't look at 200 or more uh, ranking factors. So we've picked them out and grouped them into different areas. We've got some content factors, some technical factors and some factors related to the user experience. And I mean, in the end, there are hundreds of other factors we don't yep. took a look at, um, but we wanted to, you know, give us, give you a good foundation uh, that you can take this data and apply it to your own niche, you know, to your industry and then look at the differences uh, that you have. And we've picked out some as well, we should say, where there are clear differences between the niches, because obviously, um, as Marcus said, some things are kind of foundational, maybe more similar across niches, but we're trying to highlight differences to show the um, specific nature. And now we get to the data, the fun. So we'll start off with the uh, content factors. When we say content, we mean um, basically everything that the user sees on the page. So this is text, this is videos, this is images. Um, images. These are the main three. And we start off with um, word count. That's like a most um, fundamental aspect of the content on the page is how long, it, how long is the text content. And then we have a look and we can see that in the different, well, let's Go back a bit. If we have a look just at the general average of all the um, pages we measured, we're always looking at top 10 pages ranking on Google Ads. And that's uh, across all the niches we have measured. That's right. Yep. So of all the thousands of keywords in all these different niches, the average page in the top 10 has 1,690 words. And the reason we want to show you this as well is because if you look back at all the ranking factor studies that happened over all the years, most studies, they always took the averages. You know, yep. they, they took a general keyword set, they took the averages, and then they just applied their um, historical data and they, they came with conclusions. <coughs> I'm very sorry, they came with conclusions like, oh, over time, content gets larger. And that was a conclusion we didn't believe in, like that, that in general, the content just get, get, gets larger. No, because even if the average is this, it, it's like, what does it mean for me? Because no one, not everyone has the average website. So what we do is we break it down a bit and then we have eight different bars and all different lengths. So you can see straight away across the different niches, each niche has its own different average content length. And in particular, we can see there's a big discrepancy with financial planning. We have two and a half thousand, which is, um, and in camping, we have under 1,000. So you can see in camping, you've got top 10 ranking pages with under a thousand words, whereas you don't get that in planning. So even here on a very simple metric, we see considerable differences. Yeah, and we have some examples for you. And the reason we need to show you the examples is because it's, it totally makes sense, right? I mean, in financial planning, this is now an example from camping. You see it's very visual. You have a little bit of text, but in camping, obviously, you want to kind of like browse more. You want to see different images and maybe you want to read a little bit. Whereas in financial planning, where you want to make decisions that maybe affect your whole life, not just the next um, vacation, you really want to read a lot of stuff, you know, and you see this is about pension plans. And I mean, you have only one life, right? And you only get into one pension. Yep. So planning would, would take much, much more time and kind of like more effort in making decisions. So you see the, the text here about um, pension plans is way, way longer than for camping. And this is something you have to keep in mind that where's the user, what does he want to achieve? How does it affect the life of the user? And this is also something that then kind of plays out into things like um, the content. Yeah, so I mean, some situations in life might need something long and some might need something short. That's just the um, illustration with the didgeridoo and the piccolo. Um, 
as Marcus says. Now, obviously, content is not just text, like you have images as well. Obviously, our pension plan page, you may notice, was almost exclusively text. As Marcus said, camping was much more of a visual topic. And then if we look here at images, we have an average of 16. Doesn't tell you much. But then if we break it down, we see a niche over here on the left, which is way above all the others. That's uh, furniture coming at nearly 28 images page, which sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. But that's, if you think about it, the reason, if we, this is an example Googling for wardrobes, the top ranked page is uh, Wayfair, and the fourth page is furniture in fashion, furniture for home. Fashion, fashion for home, homes, right. Um, and then you can see on the face of it, they kind of have similar content on the pages. They have image galleries, they have a few, um, a nice selection of different wardrobes and a little bit of information about each one. Looks kind of the same idea. Like the general concept of what users are looking for is similar. But then if you look at the data, Wayfair has 48 images and furniture and fashion, as it seems to be called, is uh, just 24 images, which is half as many. And again, with words, Wayfair also has a longer text which is just showing that even when they've both kind of understood approximately what the user wants, the data shows the wafers just giving them more. And these are the pages yeah. that rank better. And this is, this is a concept that's super important for your niche. That's, because in, in furniture, the thing is this, people don't look for a particular brand. They don't look for brand and then sofa or brand and then wardrobe or brand and then this, because in, in the furniture space, People used to browse a lot, you know, you yeah. go into a furniture store like IKEA or online on Wayfair or furniture in fashion, and then you start browsing because you need inspiration. And when you need inspiration, having a lot of images gives the user a broader variety of, of the options. So in this moment, it makes more sense to have more images, whereas in something like financial planning, as we have seen, images could be a distraction where the user really wants to have uh, true information. That's right. And then if we have another look, just staying on this example of uh, Wayfair and the other one, they each have a uh, text on the page and what we might refer to as an SEO text, like they're just talking about the topic a little bit to be picked up by crawlers. But you can see even with Wayfair, the text is structured nicer. It has headings. They have little pictures accompanying it. And uh, on the poorer page, the worst ranking page, it's just a block. Like there's nothing really to encourage it and you can't see it on the screen, but there's also very little of interest in the um, inferior text as always. Yeah. And it's not just a subjective view of how good the text is. We can use our um, content experience, content experience uh, text analysis to uh, assess the score of the text. And Wayfair gets 78% and the other one gets 59%, which shows it's a measure of how relevant the text is to the uh, topic searched for, in this right. case, wardrobes. Um, and then if we look more closely at the uh, keyword coverage, that's how well they use relevant keywords. Wayfair is coming in at 48% and the other one just at 27%. So we see here, it's not just someone reading the text like me and saying, oh, this one's nice, this one's not so nice. You can actually use the data to um, understand the quality and the relevance of the text what the user is looking for. Yeah. And that's not a self-fulfilling prophecy here that um, the pages who rank better automatically have a better score. <coughs> it's really about using data to understand how does this text uh, make sense in a whole topic in, in, in for every particular page. So we benchmark the text against the whole market. And that's really the case that, that we can then see it's not just the structure or are the other factors right. We are using data with our natural language processing experts and you know all the historical data we have to make this assessment. It's actually quite cool that um, you can assess text, and as you know, Stephen mentioned uh, a couple of times, Wayfair that they do a pretty good job. You know, you've seen it that they had a nice structure. They had images. You know, they also, if you really read the text on Wayfair's page, Wayfair's page it's a it's a lovely written text that you actually uh, want to read. Um, whereas often SEO texts they're hidden that people hopefully do not read the text that the text is just there for the search engine. That's a big difference. And as you can see here, Wayfair is actually over many years are pretty successful with that um, tactic. So that's why they really play the content game because like we said in furniture, I mean, they all play in the same field, you know, when they want to optimize for wardrobes mm -hmm. and sofas and, and all the other things. I mean, this is what people look for and they all have, I mean, like more or less the same sortiment because there's no brand people can sell as a certain wardrobe or couch. So that's why it's a pretty good example how Wayfair did yeah. a much, much better job than uh, others. Yeah, so I mean, what they're doing is they're just presenting the right thing for what users looking for in that case, which is what um, 
what we're talking about with these content factors. It's um, it's not always go lots of images or go long text. You have to do exactly what the users want for any given situation, which is with the glasses, you have the whiskey glass, the wine glass, the beer glass. Sometimes a beer glass is better if you want a beer, but if you want a champagne, you're better off with a flute. So it's um, everything for the its right occasion. Now we move on to uh, technical factors, which is how well uh, technically op optimized the pages. There could be hundreds of these. We're just going to look at two to keep it simple. The first one is uh, file size of the page, which will measure the, um, there are lots of different ways of measuring the size of a page, but here we're looking at the uh, length of the HTML in kilobytes. And again, here we have the average uh, is two for one. And again, um, we see a lot of difference. And if we pick out the smallest one, we've got credit pages, just 91 kilobytes. And as an example of that, if we look at um, a high ranking page, and a page on page three, this is for a credit calculator. No, this is for the loan consolidation, excuse me. Um, we have Halifax on the left or in position three, only 30. And then on the right, we have an inferior one, 190. And the interesting thing here is the size of the page is not always exactly correlated with how much content you have. Like if we look at position 25, it doesn't look that busy, not that much going on. Like you might wonder how they managed to bulk up the page so much because a lot of um technical optimization is um to do with how you build the site like you can be you can have like approximately the same amount of stuff but if it's just simply structured and nice then you can uh, save a yeah. lot of uh, weight but this is also something you have to benchmark for yourself in your industry because you have seen that for example, in furniture, the HTML file, file size on average was way higher. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we are measuring the images as an um, inclusion in the file size. It's really just the HTML. But this is not what we mean as a ranking factor in that moment, right? So it's not that Google looks, oh, your page is 91 kilobyte in finance, so you have to rank well. Mm -hmm. This is not what we mean. What, what we do here is we look at what are the differences of successful uh, to non-successful pages, and obviously, in the space, like here in financial planning, it's obviously more important to have a lean, good, optimized page with a um, small HTML file size because it seems that for the user, it's more important to get the content quick, to have a lean and fast loading page, whereas it's fine in furniture to have a larger page because people want to browse more. Yep. And if you use things like lazy loading, lazy loading, et cetera, you can really kind of load your page super quick and then just um, continue loading your page when the user starts scrolling. So, Yeah, and then if we look at, uh, that was the example of Halifax, you can see over years, they're also improving quite nicely in the last uh, 12 months. And this is the issue. Um, if you think about file sizes or how much content to put on a page, you can either, I mean, you kind of have, well, not just two, but two main options. And one is to load on everything and try to add all the trimmings and all the different bits and bobs, which might be fine for some options, like for some uh, search intents, the user really wants to get a really immersive experience and have lots of text and lots of images and lots of content and get everything about a topic. But sometimes you'll be better served with just something really simple, here's the fish and chips, because sometimes that's all the user wants. Like some uh, search queries are just served by something quick, simple, and to the point. And that's um, what you have to understand. You have to try to understand why, like which situation is the user in when he's typing in this word or this uh, this query. And that's uh, it's often very dependent on the niche. Yeah, and that's uh, the, the last technical factor, which is HTTPS. I mean, we've talked about um, machines and, you know, the different niches. And if you talk about HTTPS, I think it's super important in every niche to think about, you know, do we have to go into uh, or migrate to HTTPS from HTTP because Google and Firefox and uh, likely other browser um, manufacturers, they, they are now displaying uh, HTTP site as a non-secure site, which is a pretty big signal yeah. for everybody uh, when they go on a page. And I think even Google now is displaying a page as non-secure um, when you're not on HPS. But the thing is this, not in every niche, obviously, if you look at the different uh, color codings here, not in every niche, you're finding HPS um, distributed in, in the same amount. And if you look at um, what we just had as example, you know, financial planning or here credit, uh, in this space where, you know, people maybe give, put in their credit card data or um, other uh, personal information, it's obviously important to have already been moved to HTTPS. 
Whereas, for example, in weight loss, where you more or less consume just the content or follow tutorials or watch videos, uh, HTTPS is not that um, kind of like covered that much. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, when you have a long backlog and you want to make decisions and you are, for example, in more in the media or, in, for example, in weight loss, maybe you can move migrating to HTTPS a little bit ahead. May maybe HTTPS, from my perspective, is super important. But if you are in the financial business, you should kind of put this on the highest priority. Yeah, and this example we've got of um, dumbbell exercises, um, there's a weight loss uh, topic. And we do find websites manage to have a top ranking without HTTPS. There's uh, Men's Health, the magazine. But as we see, this is the historical trend and visibility. It's not just going up. I mean, we're not going to say it's only because they're not on HTTPS. But they're kind of going up, but they're kind of wobbling. and. And we don't know. And as Marcus says, I think over the next 12 months, as the browsers and the users get more aware of it as well through the browser's warnings, you're going to see probably websites we would expect suffering if they're not on HTTPS, even in these uh, areas where there are currently, where there's currently opportunities to succeed without it. It doesn't, we're not recommending everyone sticks to HTTP. Um, we're just showing that at the moment, it's clear some industries have been much more advanced so far. And if we look at, um, we just talked about credit, if we look at a credit calculator, mm -hmm. you don't find any HTTP uh, pages anymore. It's just HTTPS all the way down, even the first page. Mm -hmm. Actually, looked at the second page, the third page, and we couldn't <clears throat> find a page that wasn't on secure transfer because you're not going to give your data to someone who doesn't seem secure. Right. Um, that's been a lot of data. We've gone through several factors. We want to take a little um, excursion into um, a slightly, like obviously, related topic to content uh, optimization. And Marcus will talk through this. Yeah, we hope that you didn't get a headache yet. Uh, and if so, <laughs> uh, that's I think a pretty good kind of like break from all the data. And what I what we did here is we prepared two examples that are related to the ranking factors, but actually also a pretty big topic within SEO, especially when you want to have good arguments, maybe for your boss or for other people that make decisions in the company. Okay, if we look at the headaches, um, the thing is this, that's a typical kind of like site that, that you have in an SEO presentation, right? Because, you know, when you talk about your current performance and the potential, it's always like, oh, you have huge potential and this is your performance. But that's why we took a real world example. So. If it's about headaches, you can't kind of like go away and do not look at aspirin. I mean, I think they're the market leader worldwide. It's a company with a, a significant market capitalization. So we did look at their page, right? If they're a market leader for headache um, medicine uh, and you look at their page, their page actually looks quite nice, right? I mean, they have like a nice visual and text above the fold, they have good structure, they have text, they have like nice colors. So it actually looks pretty good. But if you look at their performance, and that's quite interesting, that's their um, German page, but it, I think it's very similar on all the other local pages. So if you look at their performance, you see that they in average rank with 30 keywords um, with this particular page, whereas um, the competition on average, the top 10 competition on average ranks is 456 keywords. So we ask ourselves why, because I mean, the page looks actually quite nice. It's, we call it holistic. So you get a lot of information on it. It's, it's a huge it's, brand. It's, it's good well. structure. It's a huge brand. So I don't think they have any problems with uh, the linking profile. And if you look at the data itself, you see a couple of problems. The first problem is um, you see that, I mean, they have almost um, not that many rankings, whereas the main competitors, uh, even the, the, the biggest one, they have over 1500 rankings with just one page. Uh, for this particular uh, topic, headaches. And if you if you um, then look at um, the other data, you see, oh my God, there are two other aspirin pages about treatment and about you know tips uh, from headaches. So which is interesting. And if you look then um, at uh, the rankings that this just one aspirin page has, you see they're mainly talking about themselves. So the, the rankings are mostly for their brand, like. Aspirin complex against headaches or aspirin plus C. So they're different products they have. So they rank for their product names. And this is actually a big problem what many brands obviously do that too much. They talk about themselves instead of talking about the problems the users have. And the other problem like we just showed with the data is they have internal, internal cannibalization. So they build 
too many pages where they should kind of like um, consolidate the content on one particular page, build a good um, a TOC, so table of content, and then navigate within the page. If you continue looking at the data, and this is actually a quite nice chart, because you see here on the left, you see this is um, the size of the chart based on the number of rankings they have, these 30 rankings. And the big one is um, the market leader for HeadX. And you see, I mean, they're a little bit larger than um, the aspirant page. And if you look at the rankings from the, the market leader, I mean, they really rank for what they should rank for, because, I'm um, sorry, they rank for HeadX and um, uh, different types of headaches, you know, if you have like a dump headache or if you have like like headaches that kind of like posate that come back and, and go go away. And this is really what they did, you know, they talked about the different headache types, they talked about different things, and this is what the brands actually should do, and this is what brands uh, most often do not do. They don't really use their potential because they don't need links, they don't need a lot of, you know, PR, they actually should just listen and that's something we also want to do within search metrics. That's why we do these webinars, because I believe personally, SEO needs more education. We really need to educate our bosses or the bosses of the bosses. And I mean, people who actually own budget, we need to educate them because if we do it right, if we involve the developers, if we involve the content uh, producers, then we actually can um, have a better performance. And last example, which is actually quite interesting that happened um, quite recently here in Berlin, uh, but it's actually something we see more or less happening in everywhere in the world. It's about the old and the new way in marketing. So let me explain quickly what I, what I mean here. So a couple of months ago, a pretty large company, Zalando here in Berlin, um, they are pretty large uh, e-commerce play uh, competing against the Amazons in the world. They're quite successful, but they decided they're going to cancel all the marketing um, um, positions, um, and that means they, they canceled or terminated 250 positions in their marketing team. That happened in March this year. And the reason I totally understand is, okay, we want to try and automate marketing. It's really about um, using um, machine learning or AI to kind of like make more decisions in marketing. But if you look at the SEO performance, so we have two countries here, one is the Netherlands. You see that from April where they had their peak, I mean, happening after this layoff, uh, they had a 20% loss in their visibility. And if we look at another country, that's France, Southern and France, you see it's a 15% um, decrease in visibility. And the reason is quite simple, because if you follow our webinar and you look at the content factors or technical factors and all the other factors, you always see we are trying to not just have um, using one data point and then we make a decision because SEO is something that is something that needs to go on continuously. Like looking at trends, looking at how can I update my content? Uh, how can I restructure my page? Can I make my page faster? Can I, can I kind of like reorder my content, etc.? Because the user intent changes over time. The user also wants to get updates. The user does not want to read uh, the content from last year or the content mm -hmm. from even, even further. So if you lay off your whole marketing team, including all the SEOs, and you do not have people who kind of like um, uh, look at the content, look at the, 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 the um, optimized page. If you do not have an SEO talking to a developers, you know, like judging the tickets in Jira or looking at kind of like if there's a deployment, does it really make sense? Is it SEO friendly? Is it search engine friendly, etc.? If you do not have these people anymore, maybe you, you will also, you know, have the same loss. That's not, I don't want to fright anyone here, but I, I found this a pretty nice example. Uh, to kind of like um, show how important it is to look at the various ranking factors on a continuous basis then rather than just making something once, being successful and then hoping that you will always stay in the same position. Yeah, particularly, I mean, if you stop moving and your competitors, if they keep improving and keep improving, I mean, it's a, it's a zero sum game. There's only one position one and one position two for any keywords. So if, if others are going up, you're going to be going down. It's quite a simple. Formula. Now we're going to get back to the data, what we haven't looked at yet, that's the uh, user experience factors. And here we've tried to bundle together things that um, have a direct impact on how the user perceives the page. And these are things that Google can pick up on. Um, obviously, Google doesn't have a camera, hopefully, in your room, seeing your reaction to a page, but um, Google can measure certain aspects of how the page is built. 
and um, also user signals, et cetera, to make it um, clear that if a page isn't offering a nice user experience, people aren't going to enjoy browsing on it. Um, and there are many, many user experience factors. Uh, we've picked out a few here. The first one is micro data, which even starts before you get to the page. Um, this is the use of, of um, what do you call it, um, like schema.org um, integrations, they're called, where you can kind of pick out bits of data to signify exactly what everything is on the page, like what it refers to. And the average is about seven, but we see the big differences across different industries. With the market leader, we've talked about this before, is um, recipes with 15.6 per page. And an example is this, if we look at spaghetti bolognese recipe, and you just look at the normal SERP, then you can see almost every uh, almost every search result is enhanced by some of these integrations. You have um, the rating, like how well users like it, the number of votes, and then you have cooking time, you have numbers of calories, you have ingredients. This is a very extensively um, built out structure for how to structure the data on a page. And bbcgoodfood.com does this very nicely. And it's actually, I mean, I think Marcus knows better than I do, but he would say it's not very difficult to do. Like it's just a bit of code in the, um, you can set up systems in the content management system to kind of automate the um, yes. use of the structured data. And, and the thing is this, I mean, if you look at the, the SERP result page, you see that everyone is having uh, these kind of like uh, rich results. And the thing is that in that moment when you do not have it, you maybe only have two lines of your description, you have no ratings, you have no additional information, mm -hmm. you probably are not seen that much, or maybe Google is not even going to rank you because you don't provide the information the user likely want to read um, already on the search result page. Yeah, and you sometimes see uh, with recipes, um, you sometimes see results where they try to make a meta description look like it's structured data, but it's messy and you can't really read it because it's all just non-formatted. And you just stand out a lot better if you have uh, yeah. properly structured information. And this, I mean, that the, the image uh, stock photo actually describes it very nicely because, I mean, when you want to consume recipes, you want to make it, I mean, likely during you cook, right? It should be something that's readable on your smartphone or your tablet. So structured data in that moment totally makes sense. Um, so as Google is going to use the data for the purpose because the user wants to actually kind of like consume it in that way. If we, another factor of the user experience is internal links. This is obviously something that um, a crawler can measure very easily. Um, and if we look here, um, average 194, but again, huge differences in one niche in particular stands out here. This is, uh, this is our friend furniture, furniture from earlier uh, with over 400 on average on the top 10. Yeah, and why do we show this? I mean, it's, that, that makes sense because uh, the number of internal links is something SEOs or other people who build websites are concerned about since many, many years, right? I mean, the Google Webmaster Guidelines 15 years ago, they even had a particular number in it where Google said you should have around 100 links or not more than 100 links on your page. I mean, that's really old information. That's nothing Google recommends anymore. But because of this, SEOs were always debating, you know, what is a good amount? But actually, there is no number that fits all kind of like industries or niche because it's really it really depends on first the, num the amount of information you have and second how you want to structure the the the, the information flow on your website because yeah. the random server that comes to your website an internal link is a choice you give him so in that moment when you increase the number of choices you know you also distract him and that that's why you really want to you know take care um, on the number of choices you give him, and you see, I mean, when you look at furniture, it's a lot, and then credit financial planning, it's not that much, because also in both niche, you do not have the same amount of information or products, so you, that's why they, you can also reduce the number of internal links you have. And then if we look at our example from earlier, uh, Wayfair, the top ranked page uh, for wardrobes, is, has 413, that's almost exactly at the uh, top average and the honest 315 which is actually more than the average in a lot of the other niches but for furniture it's maybe it's not quite enough or it's not as much as how the best pages are doing and then if we look at what kind of links they have um this is a very clear example wayfair below the image gallery they have a selection of links to other related searches like so that because not everyone knows exactly what kind of wardrobe they might start off with a more generic search but then they think oh i want to get get a double hanging wardrobe, or in this case, a slide door wardrobe. And if you have these um, related searches on your page already, then you can keep the user 
on your site and he doesn't have to go back to Google and start searching for something else and maybe end up somewhere else. So this way you can kind of um, guide the user through their journey and keep them on your domain rather than um, having them kind of bounce back to Google and maybe go shopping somewhere else. And then we all know what it's like if you get lost in a shop or in a store, um, it's not a nice shopping experience and you're not going to want to go back there. Then, and there's several other factors. Now we want to look at lists, like lists, you could put them with content, obviously, because they're a form of structuring the content, but a list or a table, this is a way of um, guiding like the user's eyes to a certain piece of the content. It makes things easier to read. It makes things easier to digest. So it's often useful for um, creating the user experience here. There isn't as much di differentiation as in other um, ranking factors. We wanted to show this as well that in, Obviously, for some, there's kind of like a standard, and for and in others, some niches stand out a lot more than others. And here in lists, lists are generally quite useful, you could say, but there are a few niches where they stand out a bit more. We have uh, cars, financial planning, destinations, some way above some of the others. And that's important because, I mean, if, if you look at your content and you want to understand what does the user want, having this benchmark against your niche or against your competition is actually quite useful. Because what we try to do is, I mean, we're not reading the content actually. I mean, we're looking at the data. Uh, it gives us a pretty good kind of like feeling about, okay, what should, how should the content be structured in a certain niche? And if you look at financial planning here with 1.9 on average number of lists, but if you looked at um, the amount of content, the content was quite large, you know, 3,300 words on average. Um, or like with yeah, the top player yeah, yeah. for pension plan, the example we had, this is not a large amount of lists, but actually lists are important. This is how you should kind of like think of it, that you do not just, you know, put lists in, you know, make an assessment of, you know, how your niche is or how your competition is, and then maybe, you know, think about your user and then make your uh, decisions. And there's an example of where niches can come up if we search for cheap cars in the UK, um, Top Positions Gumtree, that's a website that's doing pretty well. and um, like a list, it, it might be, it, it doesn't always look like a list. I mean, what the, what's an HTML list? Like it could be part of the search section with different fields. It could be different suggestions. If we scroll down, it's different options, different parameters, different ways of setting filters. And then for the crawl, these are all um, unordered lists, yeah. but it's just ways of structuring the, um, the content on the page. And this is why we class this as a user experience factor, because the things that contribute to a positive experience make it easier for the the user to find their way around, um, similarly to the links. Yeah. And this is a website that's doing really well. If you look at Gumtree, they're going pretty much up. They're, um, they were even, I think, longer ago, even lower. So there's a very positive long-term trend. And this is what the happy user looks like, who's found his, uh, his cheap car, excuse me, or his cheap wardrobe. Yeah, so, then, then, then we were curious about uh, what can, else can we do? So if you look at the data, um, you see that, okay, we looked at eight different niches and you see that there are some, sometimes significant differences in these niches, sometimes there aren't. But what we also wanted to do, I mean, that's why Step Beyond, is we wanted to kind of like look into more evidence that's more or less official. Because uh, when we measure things like HTML size or speed of the website or other factors, they're always biased by the data that we use, right? So when we measure the speed, we look at uh, time to first byte and we look at the response time, et cetera. But you know, when, when you look at things that you can do on your own, you very quickly come to something like Google Lighthouse. So Google Lighthouse is something that's baked into uh, Chrome. It's part of the Chrome developer tools. If you open the uh, uh, Chrome developer tools on the right side, you find a tab, it's called audits, and you can perform this audit on each individual landing page. Everyone can do that. You don't need to have anything special and it's also for free. In that moment when you perform that audit, you will uh, be provided with five different um, overall scores in these different areas from performance to SEO. And in each of these different areas, you get a lot of different um, uh, uh, details. And in total, Google gives you more than 100 different yeah. factors. And what we did actually is we performed this as a ranking factor study. So we took all these couple hundred factors, run them of hundreds of thousands of URLs and came then uh, to insights that are actually quite interesting because 
in that moment when you uh, take Google Lighthouse, you actually take uh, tools that Google provided, and then you take these tools, and because Google is running um, the simulation, for example, they simulate the speed, 3G speed or 4G speed, whatever you want to do on all these landing pages, and then you have a really Apple to Apple uh, comparison. And we don't want to kind of like bother you with all the details, so we can send you if you are interested in uh, this, um, uh, all the raw data and uh, more details. But for this webinar, we thought we show you a couple of things um, that we found interesting, especially here in the technical field. So in this table, you see um, a couple of the features that Google is using in Lighthouse, like uh, is there a minified JavaScript uh, used or how fast actually is the website when it comes to um, meaningful pane? That means like, is there something meaningful visible already above the fold, you know, things like this. And when we start looking at um, some data, we um, start with JavaScript here and first meaningful paint, it, it actually looks like this. So this is about minified JavaScript. So like all the others, you see on the x-axis, the positions on, on the y-axis, you see the score. Uh, in Google Lighthouse, you can always uh, uh, switch between the score and the raw data. The reason why we use the scores in, in this case here is because um, they're easier consumable in that kind of chart, but for the user, if you want to do it on yourself, I will show you quickly how it looks like in the browser. It's actually something you can use very quickly, and maybe even talk to your developers, because not everybody knows how to minify JavaScript. But what you can see in the chart is here that the pages who have better rankings, they actually minify their JavaScript more than pages who do not have good rankings. Yeah, well, I can just, uh, just what Mark said about the scores, just to make that quite clear, um, most of the Lighthouse audits are on a pass-fail basis, where Google sets a threshold that says, okay, you're doing it well enough or not doing it well enough, and if you pass, that's a one, and if you don't pass, it's a zero. So here you can say 85% um, of the top three pages are using minified JavaScript to Google's mm -hmm. satisfaction, so they pass the audit. Yeah. And using this, uh, these uh, percentages where it makes it nice to easier to compare the different um, lighthouse audits because if they're all on a percentage scale with the pass fails. Because if you fail and 95% of the others pass, you should likely take a look at um, these factors. Yeah. Okay, so this is an example, so on lip. Um, so if you just click on one of the results here, um, position five, and then you perform um, the lighthouse audit. So the yeah. page actually looks quite nice. But what you can see here is quickly, they definitely have a lot of potential to minify their JavaScript. Google even gives you concrete yep. um, details, which JavaScript files actually you can save a lot of um, kilobytes. And this is something you can just take and go to your developer and then kind of like start doing the housekeeping. And we find this actually quite interesting. So we have correlated many, many, many factors against rankings. And this is just one factor, but what it allows you quickly when you look at JavaScript and or um, CSS files, this is something where you can do housekeeping um, way, way um, quicker. If 85% of the top pages are doing it and you're not, then I mean, that's um, it's definitely a sign they should be uh, yeah. joining. Okay, and then there's another one. Now, uh, time to first meaningful paint. This is one of several um, page speed factors. There's um, time to first byte is included, time to first meaningful paint, time to first contentful paint. And again, Google has a threshold that it considers a pass. And here we see again, if we look at the chart, we see the top, in particular, the top three or four uh, positions are loading faster than the others. Again, this is the pass fail. So this is the loading what Google considers a good time. And then after about position four or five, it kind of flattens out. This shows that the ones that's ranking right at the top are um, they're just better. That means they're cleaner. Users are getting to the useful content they can understand more quickly. Yeah. And then there's an example of a not that very quick site. Yeah, and this is an impeachment president. Um, and if we go to page two, if you go all the way down, you get CNN.com. You may have heard of this uh, website. And they're ranking position 20, even though obviously they've got relevant content, they're a well-known uh, brand, trusted uh, media organization. And yet, um, if you run the Lighthouse audit, they actually get a performance score of one out of 100 for this URL. And in particular, the first meaningful paint score is uh, much slower than what Google considers okay. So there, um, that, that hurts, you know? I mean, I mean, they're gonna be losing out on a lot of, um, and it's just one example, but if they're going to be regularly 
um, performing that poorly, then they're going to be missing out on lots of traffic, which is a shame because they have quite a nice page. Like the content looks okay. It, it's obviously well researched, but it's not. Um, if you're not doing what users if it's, need, like if it's well researched or not, we can't judge. No. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but neutral. actually, CNN is a pretty well-known brand, yeah. um, so they could uh, rank better for this term, but they aren't. Yeah. Okay. Let's take uh, a look at the last example. So we have talked about HTTPS. So HTTP2 is also something that's quite innovative, and uh, a lot of companies already migrate to HTTP2, which allows websites to load um, many things in parallel. So it means you have a faster website. And including with HPS, it's actually much more secure. And if you look at the pass fail um, test and the scores here, you see that the pages who are more successful migrated already to HTTP2. Of course, it could be different in your niche, but it's interesting to see that actually pages who are a little bit more successful already migrated to HTTP2, which is something what I believe Google is going to push uh, further ahead um, in the next couple of years. And then if we look at an example, this is from the uh, financial industry, looking at which pages use HTTP2. We have um, the featured snippet passes, then lots of passes down, but then a couple of fails, and these aren't small websites that are failing. This is uh, Bank of America. Uh, isn't it on HTTP2? I mean, I'm saying failing, it's failing the audit. It's failing the specific audit in the Lighthouse. Um, it doesn't mean the website itself is completely failing, but it does mean or one result is that it's ranking below smaller banks, like Bank of America is certainly one of the top two or three banks in the country, and yet it's ranking behind less known, less well-known. Yeah, you see that many of the, sorry, you see that many of the requests are not HP2 requests. Yeah. So that, that's also something you can use again out of the audit to kind of like have takeaways immediately. It's another thing, even though here we're measuring passing and failing, it's highly, highly specific information that Google gives you about why you're failing and exactly where. The same with the JavaScript and um, all the other audits. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that that no one is big to fail, no. haha. Uh, uh, but the thing is, I mean, especially when you're big and you move slow, you should even have a bar better prioritization of what you should do and what you should, shouldn't. All right. So... Um, we really hope that you enjoyed uh, the webinar so far. Uh, we have enough time to go over all the questions you have. Um, you're still free kind of like going in, asking your questions. And like I said, after the webinar, uh, in a couple of hours or days, you're going to get a link with the recording and everything. Okay, so um, now we can come to a few of your questions. We've got a few minutes. Uh, the first question we received says, uh, does the actuality of the topic, like how up-to-date, how current it is, have a significant impact on the ranking of a page? So I think that's a very good question. So thank you for that. So I believe, uh, depending on the niche, the actuality of the content could be incredibly relevant. So when you are, let's say, we take furniture again, because we had it from e-commerce, uh, I think the actuality could then have an impact when um, the search demand for something goes up. So imagine uh, in springtime, people search for garden furniture or for grills. I think having good actual and optimized content according to the increase in search demand, I think that has uh, a positive effect on your ranking because in that moment you show Google that you actually really do care about the topic and you really do provide uh, probably newer information than uh, other people. But it could be that in things like um, pension plans or other topics, maybe it's more important to have good holistic content where you cover many aspects, where you do not really need to kind of like update everything all the time. So it really depends on um, all the different kind of like needs and you should look at um, the seasonality of um, the queries for your content because it could be that even if in a topic you know where you believe okay there are not that many things that should be updated um, that there, at some point you should update the content right so the, i think in general you can't say the actuality always has a significant impact but i really believe it has a significant impact in that moment when google sees an increase in demand so you have more fresher actual content that should have um, a measurable impact 
uh, we have another question. They're asking uh, how can we, how can like a machine level, what tool can be used to measure the readability of text? Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of free libraries to uh, assess the readability. I personally believe the readability, um, like um, like readability by flash or other readability um, kind of like methods or libraries, they are not used by Google to kind of like score the content. Of course, if you have a text for like children and it's written by a rocket scientist and it's actually super complicated, I totally believe that this is something that should not rank. But there are many other factors that Google can use uh, to see if the page uh, or if that content is relevant because the bounce rate will be very high for this complicated text. Um, the other user signals will be very high uh, for this significant uh, for this text. So I don't believe that Google is using the readability in this particular or in, in any case. Uh, but readability is something you could kind of like measure quickly for yourself. There are a lot of um, free tools. And um, if you really want to kind of like benchmark your text, uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, but we looked at um, uh, uh, ranking factors also a couple of years ago on readability, and we haven't really found any correlation on readability at all. Yeah. Should point out though, if you have a topic that is more complicated, then you don't like um, easy readability wouldn't always be good anyway. If you had a topic like uh, pension plans or credit scores, um, or something more academic like um, something scientific. Then it might. Then you don't want to be too superficial. You need to sometimes uh, have more complicated text or just more complicated topics. So again, it all depends on the um, the topic you're dealing. So then there's this question: um, if the ranking factors vary uh, from countries or languages. So yes, they do. Mm -hmm. So in this moment, uh, when you looked at the results, we took data from Google.com. So it's very likely that if you look at Google Co UK or Google.com. Uh, .au or uh, other English-speaking countries, it's very likely that you have sometimes slight differences, sometimes mm -hmm. significant differences, sometimes it will be the same, because in each individual market uh, you have a different um, foundation. And if you look at Google.com, from my perspective, Google.com is always most advanced because they have more um, SERP feature integrations, so they have kind of like a different uh, way in you know how presenting how to present the search results. So Google need to use a different kind of like way to kind of like prioritize the, the, the rankings. And if you look into countries where Google is not that developed that much, like like complicated languages, like I don't know, Finnish or um, maybe Chinese or other more complex languages, I believe that Google is using more trivial and traditional ranking factors to score the results. So I'm not blaming any country here that they have bad results. I'm just saying um, maybe in some countries, things like traditionally like backlinks or page rank or just very traditional ranking, uh, sorry, content factors are overruling maybe other more machine learning based factors that Google are already applying in um, Google.com or Google Co UK or Google um, Germany. Maybe. This is why if you are um, analyzing your, um, your competition, like the competitive landscape that you're operating in, you obviously have to look at the um, the Google index that's relevant to you, like where your customers are. Yes. Um, so it's no good if you're in um, Australia just looking at US data, or if you're in um, the UK only looking at Australian. Um, you really need to look at what's happening in your market. Yeah. But we should say as well, um, this is US.com data, but where some of our examples here are from the UK because there are obviously overlaps. I mean, I think Google. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they would very often. Um, maybe test something as well in America, like you mentioned, yeah. uh, the SERP integrations. Um, and then if it, if they, once they get it kind of perfected, they might roll it out in other countries. So it's not like we're, it's a completely different universe, but it will just be slightly different. And if you really want to nail in on what's super relevant to your market, then you'll see that's where you need to look. Okay. And then we have another question that is, um, have we done any analysis on server-side versus client-side JavaScript and its correlation to rankings? Um, so no, we haven't, because what we did with the JavaScript uh, analysis here is we just uh, run um, the Lighthouse audit, which is uh, client-side rendering of the JavaScript. So what we actually did is we used Chrome, but not one Chrome instance. We used many Chrome instances at the same time. 
and we just run the Lighthouse audit, which is then rendering the page by a simulated speed of 3G uh, with exactly the same uh, kind of like foundation for each individual landing page. So no, we haven't, but that's actually a good question. And maybe next time we think about differentiating it. Great. Okay. Um, we still have a few minutes. If you do have another question, please ask it. And otherwise we um, will bid adieu. We want to say thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we want to also remind you of our feedback survey because we're always looking to improve these webinars and also not just these webinars, but generally the research that we do. So if you have any suggestions like this server-side client-side rendering, um, please let us know anything uh, that you think we could do better or think that we could uh, focus on more. We'd be always happy to hear from you. And here we've, uh, have we got another, oh, we've got some more questions. Can you please list the important factors one more time? Oh, it's a very good and tricky question. So the thing is, depending on your niche, right? You know, if you are in financial planning, I mean, if I would talk about important factors, the first thing what I would do is when I would be in this particular field, I would look at the content. You know, do you have enough content? Do you provide in-depth content in a way that you cover all the questions that people have? So I believe there's no list of factors that are can be generalized for every niche. I think these times are over. So you, you can't expect, you know, like a bar chart, you know, with longer and smaller bars and you just take this and it's like, okay, for 2018 or 2019, these are the factors. It really varies see, seriously. And this is also uh, something that's not going away because in the age of machine learning, you know, Google applies their knowledge on, on results. Uh, it's really going into the niche rather than to general ranking factors. But we do want to kind of like more studies, do more studies on things that are more common, but we can't answer this in this webinar today. You can get all the information as mentioned at the start. It's on the white paper, so everything, um, or at least the main uh, niche factors we covered here are in the, um, the white paper, which is a, um, a download. Um, so feel free to take that and look into it in detail. Um, there you've got all the data. Okay. Okay, there's one last question. This says, um, since not all pages can be interlinked from category pages or navigation menus, which tips would you recommend to ensure good crawling via internal linking? And how would you address this in the mobile first era? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So it really depends on how much content you have. So there's always this kind of like less is more. That's, that's important. I mean, when you talk to SEOs, SEOs, today rather look at uh, de-indexing pages, you know, getting pages out of the index rather than getting more pages into the index. That's definitely a common trend, which totally makes sense because if you save crawl equity, if you give Google only what's relevant, you can ensure that Google, you know, gets the relevant information first and crawls these pages more frequently. But coming back to your question, in that moment when you have a typical, like let's say an e-commerce like structure from the homepage, you have categories and then you have like like products. So what I really would try to understand is when I have, let's say, 1 million potential pages, most companies do the, the mistake that um, they show all the categories on, on each page. So it means if you have, let's say, 200 categories and you go on each page, you always show already 200 internal links, which, you know, sucks up a lot of um, kind of like space, you know, a lot of internal number of internal links already. And imagine you have, when you're in e-commerce, you know, electronics and you have maybe, I don't know, furniture and you have books, let's say like an Amazon, you just have everything. Then when, when you send people on a furniture page and, you, page and you also show, you know, like the categories for electronics, they have nothing in common. You know, someone who wants to shop for furniture is very likely not looking for electronics, very likely not looking for everything else than, you know, furniture related categories. So what I would suggest in that moment is that that you really look at, okay, when I'm on a category page like furniture, I would only display what's necessary, like all subcategories of furniture and hide everything else. Of course, when you're a large brand and you have all these different, you know, um, categories, you should kind of like give the user an option to maybe show in a mega menu, I mean, like all categories, but that should be it. You should not have all categories on each individual page because then you build a funnel where you always display kind of like all, all categories and you dilute um, the, the relevance of each um, specific category. 
So that's that's if if, if you follow this tip, you can from the home page link to all categories. And then within each individual categories, you have the subcategories, which then allows you to open up very quickly, uh, kind of like the, the funnel to all the product pages. And in that moment, you do not have to have 500, 600, 700 internal links. You maybe just stay at 200 or 300, but you only link to all the pages who are actually um, related and relevant. Great, um, that's the hour up. Um, so thanks once again for joining and um, we look forward to hearing your feedback. Thanks for your questions already. And um, yeah, that's bye from me. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.